It's great to see you today. Great to be with you and uh, just sharing another time as we go into God's Word and see what Jesus has said to us. Um, turn in your Bibles to John chapter 10 as we continue in our, in our trip through the sayings of Jesus this year. We've come to a passage that is probably very familiar to, to many of you, a great passage, a really important passage. John chapter 10, beginning with verse 27, and we'll look down through verse 30. Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Now this is an amazing teaching. Clearly, we refer to it often in all sorts of aspects of our relationship with the Lord. But as we read this, it's important to understand and remember that Jesus wasn't here teaching his disciples about their relationship with him. He wasn't talking to people who were following him. He was talking about people who follow him to people who didn't follow him. In the context of the passage, this was, he was really judging the Pharisees. He had constantly banged heads with Pharisees. In this context, in chapter 9, he had healed a blind man, and the Pharisees were really mad about it. The Pharisees were the super religious Jewish people who believed they were better than everyone else. They were so upset because they felt like maybe they were losing a follower. And so they had argued with this guy to try to convince him, what, that no, you didn't actually used to be blind? And he just kept going, look, I don't know who this guy is, but all I can say is, I've been blind, and all of a sudden, I can see. And they were trying to, you know, harp away at him enough that they finally just kicked him out of the temple. They go, that's it. You're not Jewish anymore. Get out of here. And so the poor guy's like, well, what happened? I was blind, I see, and now I'm kicked out of my, my fellowship. But Jesus then came up to him and revealed to him who he was. And so the guy responded to Jesus and now really believed in him. That just had to make the Pharisees go nuts. Because think about it. The Pharisees are people who, they're supposed to be the leaders. Their whole career, their whole life is built around being the spiritual representatives of God to the people. And Pharisees had worked really hard to get where they were. I mean, they strictly regimented themselves, restricted themselves, held themselves to such a high standard that really no one could compare to them. In fact, even the name Pharisee refers to the fact that they would draw a line around themselves and go, we're in and you're out. And yet, the only reason they had a job, the only reason they had a gig is because people would respect them, hold them up on a pedestal, and listen to what they had to say. So now, along comes Jesus, and he seems to like to break the rules. He seems to bring a new perspective on what they had been teaching, and he hadn't been educated in their schools at all, but it was killing them that people were leaving their control and walking off and following after this renegade teacher, Jesus. So as they came to Jesus to try to put him down, he would lock horns with them and try to let them see the reality that, of who he is. Now, in this case, in chapter 10, he starts talking about being a shepherd, and he kind of devotes most of the chapter to this. Now, when we hear him saying, him saying I am the good shepherd, Everybody who came before me are thieves and liars. Hirelings run off. A shepherd stays with the sheep. And he's doing all these things. I mean, you can even see without realizing it that this was something that would make them very uncomfortable. But there's a, a historical context that's important to understand too. And that is the Pharisees 
saw themselves as shepherds. The word pastor means shepherd. They saw themselves as those who are shepherding the sheep. Because in the Old Testament, God had often instructed the leaders to be like shepherds, and they understood. David wrote, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. So they would call themselves pastor. They would call themselves shepherd. But Jesus is saying, you're not the real deal at all. You're posers. You're fake. And that would affront them greatly because it threatens their way of life. Now, when you listen to what Jesus is teaching about shepherds, you can't help but realize that these Pharisees who studied the Old Testament well would remember those passages of Scripture that would, where God would talk to the shepherds of Israel and say, you're blowing it. Now, one of the predominant passages that I'm sure as he was talking to them that would have come to their mind right away is Ezekiel 34. And if, you, if you'd like, if you think you can find Ezekiel, um, you could turn over to Ezekiel 34 for a minute because this was like a shot as, as Jesus was talking to them about what a real shepherd is, they had to have thought of this passage of scripture that they had probably memorized when they were kids in training. Ezekiel 34, God talks to the leaders of Israel. And beginning with verse one, it says, the word of the Lord came to me, that's Ezekiel, saying, son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God to the shepherds, woe to the shepherds of Israel who feed themselves should not the shepherds feed the flocks? You eat the fat and clothe yourselves with the wool. You slaughter the fatlings, but you do not feed the flock. And he goes on to say, because of that, they've wandered off. They don't have anyone to lead them because you see them as just someone who can pad your pocket, not someone that you are caring for. And then uh, in verse, uh, verse 10, he says, thus says the Lord God, behold, I am against the shepherds and I will require my flock at their hand. I'll cause them to cease feeding the sheep. The shepherds shall feed themselves no more. I'll deliver my flock from their mouths that they may no longer be food for them. And then look at verse 11, for thus says the Lord God, indeed, I myself will search for my sheep and I will seek them out as a shepherd seeks out his flock. In verse 15, I will feed my flock and I'll make them lie down, says the Lord God. So God's saying, I'm going to be the shepherd. But then in verse 23, he says, and I will establish one shepherd over them and he shall feed them. My servant David, or that was a messianic term, because he was going to be a son of David. He shall feed them and be their shepherd, and I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David, a prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. And then finally down in verses 30 and 31, thus they shall know that I, the Lord, their God, am with them, and they, the house of Israel, are my people, says the Lord God. You're my flock, the flock of my pasture. You are men, and I am your God, says the Lord God. Now, considering that, something that the Pharisees would have been well versed in, now along comes Jesus on the scene to these so-called shepherds. And he says, everyone who came before me is a fake. I will shepherd my sheep. I am the good shepherd. Now, this would have really upset them. It would, it would be an affront to them. And partly because they realized they were, they were losing it too. Their success was being threatened by this renegade preacher. Now, as we look at what he said here in verses 27 through 30, this is sort of where his argument focuses because he lays out in order the reasons why his leadership his shepherding is so superior to what these religious leaders were trying to do. And so, as we look at this passage, 
and break it down, we just see that, that here are the distinctions of a good shepherd. The first thing he says, he calls them my sheep. Earlier in the chapter, he talked about shepherds who weren't shepherds at all, they were hirelings, that it was just a job for them. And now he says, I'm the owner of these sheep, they are mine. So, I mean, right away, there's a difference. The, the Pharisees wouldn't say, oh, those are mine. They would say, or those are God's sheep. For, as far as they're concerned, this was just a job. I'm just doing what I do in order to provide for myself, in order to make a living. Uh, these people are just necessary for me to do what I do, but they're not mine. I don't want to take ownership and responsibility for them. I'm not invested in them. Jesus said, they're mine because my Father gave them to me. And so as he said they're mine, he was saying that with a sense of pride of ownership. He's like, no, you are mine. You're my sheep. And that was something that the Pharisees couldn't compete with at all. The fact is, he was saying, my sheep are mine because my Father gave them, and therefore they are precious to me. They are of inestimable value to me. They're mine. Pharisees, nah. They can come and go, it doesn't matter. As long as there's enough there to keep me going, keep me flowing, I'm fine. Now he says they are my sheep. In the same way that you might say, that is my child. You know, when we see our kids, sometimes our kids do stuff and we go, oh, that's your child, it's yours. I'll say, you know, say to Ann, well, your son did this. But the feeling of going, that's mine. I, I heard Andy Stanley recently, who's Charles Stanley's son, talking about when he was a kid, he and his friend Louis Giglio would ditch church. And Charles Stanley's church is very large and it's live on television there in the Atlanta area. And he said what they would do, they would ditch out after Sunday school and they would go down to this um, you know, burger place down the street. And they had a TV in there. And he said they would turn the channel over to his dad, to Charles Stanley, and then hear a couple of things that he said. And then they'd turn it back to, to football. And, and then when he'd get in the car to go home from church, he would go, Dad, I love that point you made about this. This is when he, and he's like 11 years old. And totally snowing his dad. One day he got in the car and he said, um, Son, Mrs. So-and-so said that she saw you and Louie coming, walking back to church. And she said that you ditched church. And Andy said, well, what'd you tell her? <laughs> and he said, I told her, you worry about your kids and I'll worry about my kids. And he said that felt so good. And his dad never mentioned it again. And he stopped watching, you know, a few minutes of church down the street. But the idea of you're mine, you're my son, and you're my problem, and nobody else intrudes into that. That's the way that Jesus feels about his sheep. It's the way he feels about us. He takes pride in us being his possession. There may be other people who feel like they don't want to claim you, depending on what you're doing. But he says, you're mine. You're my sheep. And then secondly, he says, my sheep hear my voice. Now, we can look at this from the standpoint of certainly it's important to study his word and to hear what he has to say, but I think he's going even deeper than that because what he's saying is they really get me. They understand what I'm saying. They hear in the way that they distinguish the difference between what I'm saying and what everyone else is saying. And you may know this about shepherds. When they call, the sheep recognize the voice of, the, of their particular shepherd. And even when there are a lot of sheep feeding, when the shepherds call, they all go to their shepherd. And so it's not just the idea of they can hear what I'm saying, but they can distinguish my voice. And see, for the Pharisees, they were always insecure in who was going to follow them because they were losing supporters. And why? I mean, the Pharisees had studied all their lives to get where they were. And along comes Jesus, 
And there's something about what he said that resonated with them. You can just tell. When you hear what Jesus says, you go, wow, that is, it just sounds right to me. It just sounds like something really special and really meaningful. And so Jesus is saying, they're listening to me because they are hearing something from me that they're not hearing from you. And if they're not listening to you in the same way that they listen to me, don't go attack them for listening to me. They are hearing something that they need. Therefore, they're responding. Why don't you say things? Why isn't your teaching inspiring that sort of loyalty, that kind of resonance? They listen to what you say, and they go, eh. And they listen to what I say, and they go, yes, that's great. How could they compete with this? You know, they get it. Now, and the implication certainly is because the Pharisees had listened to Jesus a bunch, and they're listening to him, and they're going, I really don't see what anybody sees in what you're saying. This is, this is not, it's not profound. We give better messages than you do. And Jesus would say to them, then you're not my sheep. Nobody has to follow me, but if you, if you hear me and that resonates, then you're my sheep. If you don't get it, and if you're here today and you've just never really understood what the deal is with Christianity and, and you still don't, and after we're finished this morning, you're like, no, I don't get it. That's okay. Maybe you're not a sheep. Maybe you're not a sheep yet. Maybe he wants you to be a sheep. At some point, when it starts to click, when it starts to make sense, then that's when you want to listen. But Jesus contrasted himself with the Pharisees in that his sheep recognize his voice. They know where it's coming from. The Pharisees didn't have any kind of equivalent thing. In fact, the Pharisees were kind of frustrated that people wouldn't listen to them. Anytime you speak to people, anytime you're trying to communicate and they don't get it, so often we feel like they won't listen. No, maybe what you're saying just doesn't resonate with them. And when you're having a discussion with someone and they seem to just not get it, are you okay with that? Are you okay with just saying, hmm, some things you get, some things you don't, I tried, not, nothing personal. For the Pharisees, they were very bitter against people who wouldn't listen to them. Jesus was just like, ah, my sheep listen, they get it. But then he says, thirdly, he says, my sheep hear my voice, I, you know, and I know them. I know them. That word means to understand them, to really get it about them. Now, the Pharisees didn't really know their people. They, the people who were there were just props. They were just like extras. Somebody who was just, well, we need them there because we need to have people. Somebody needs to keep bringing their offerings so that we can continue to live in the lifestyle to which we've become accustomed. But, and it, it kind of reminds me of one time years ago I, when the first early computer programs were coming out to manage churches. And I went to um, observe a, the leading company who was doing that sort of thing. And as they were doing their presentation, they referred to the people at your church as tithing units. It's like, <laughs> these are just... Anonymous people with checkbooks, you know, was, was kind of the way they looked at it. Didn't purchase that software, wasn't impressed by that mentality at all. But that was the Pharisees. They were like, no, these are just blank faces who support us. But Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them. We would have expected him to say something like, my sheep hear my voice and they know me. To, to us, it's all about who knows me. But to him, it was like, I know them. Now, he isn't just saying that I know each of them and who they are. No doubt, when, when he had thousands of people following him, he didn't know everyone's name. But he says, I understand them. 
One reason why they heard his voice is because as they listened to him, they got the feeling, he gets me. He really understands me. He desires to know what makes me tick. And it's one of the greatest um, things that I love about, about God, that God knows everything about me. When I come to him and I need to confess a sin, when I've done something wrong, I, I don't have to explain to him why I did it. I don't have to tell him, God, I was depressed, tired, hungry, and I just, I did it. No, he, I go, God, here, hey, here's what I did. And he goes, Dave, I totally understand. I get that. I know why you did what you did. I know what your heart is. I'm not going to blast you over it. I know you. Now, you may have a few people in your life who really, really know you. And sometimes people who you think you know will do things that you go, I thought I knew you, but wow, I guess I don't. But Jesus knows you perfectly, you know, way better than any of our human relationships can have. I'm so thankful for my wife, Anne, who today, by the way, is the 34th anniversary of when we got married. So... It doesn't have anything to do with the message. It's just that it occurred to me that this would be an easy way to get people to clap. And that really, that really feels good. No, no but you, uh, you know, we know each other way better than we did 34 years ago. But God knows us, Jesus knows us so well that he totally, he never misjudges us. He never misunderstands something that we do. He never questions our motives. He knows our motives, and he knows that they're mixed. But he says, I know you perfectly, and I still want you, and I'm still proud that you are mine. And that, to me, is mind-blowing. I'm blown away that somebody who could know me for, you know, this well for really 35 years since we've really known each other, still wants to be married to me, but we're talking about Jesus going, I know everything that you think. I know everything you've ever done. I know that even when you did good things, sometimes you had bad motivation. I know all of that totally well, like a shepherd would know their sheep and understand them. And I still want you. I still want you as my sheep. I love that. That's that's extremely comforting to me. The Pharisees, they can't compare to that. They didn't understand. So they're talking to a guy who just got healed of blindness, and they can't figure out why he would be interested in the guy who healed them. They're like, I don't get this. But Jesus, as our shepherd, he knows us completely. And then he goes on and says, my sheep hear my voice, I know them, and they follow me. Of course, that's really a shot at the Pharisees because he's like, if you're worried about losing people, why aren't they following you? My sheep follow me. But it also gets down to the essence of why he chooses the metaphor of sheep and a shepherd. I think this is really profound, and I really love this as I've thought about it. The way that you guide sheep is that the shepherd gets out in front and he talks and they recognize his voice and they kind of move in the general direction that he is going. Now, you don't drive sheep like you drive cattle. Sheep don't follow the way little ducklings do. Sheep were a great metaphor. We saw Justin had pulled up a video on the internet this week of a shepherd leading his sheep. And I, it was so cool to watch it because, and if I was slick, I would have had it up here for you. But um, what happens is the shepherd's walking along and the sheep are like wandering all over the place. They're not, they're not like in single file. Nobody's beating them or anything. They're just kind of meandering. And some of them get way off the track, but they're, it's amazing. They work their way back in as they listen to the voice of the shepherd. And I thought, 
that's so much like the way he leads us. He doesn't drive us. The Pharisees, they were trying to force the people into submission. They were saying, you need to do this and this and this, and you can't do this and this and this. And they were telling people, here's how you should dress. Here's what you should eat. Here's when you should go, where you go. They were, they were legislating some kind of a, a moral standard that was their arbitrary standard, essentially, that sort of developed from human understandings of the law, but it was a driving sort of thing. One of the things I love about Jesus is he just goes, okay, I'm going over here. And, and sometimes I get off because he gives me that kind of freedom like a shepherd gives sheep, to wander around a bit, maybe take some bad detours. But as long as I'm listening to his voice... I always end up meeting up with him. It always brings me there, while at the same time, it's the life. Because if you're listening to his voice, you're always reorienting yourself and you end up going in the right direction. The other thing about sheep is that if a shepherd loves them, he keeps them on the move. They follow me, why? Why is he going anywhere? There are some animals that stay where they are forever. It's just like, this is where you are. But the thing about sheep, they're not the brightest animals. They're some of the dumbest animals. But sheep, if you leave them in one pasture, they'll not only eat all the grass, they just keep eating and eating and eating and getting fatter, but they also will pull the grass up by the roots so that then they destroy the pasture. It's not going to ever produce you know, any more grass for anybody else to eat. And so shepherds have to keep the sheep moving. They have to keep changing their environment because it's like, no, you are not at a feeding trough. You are meandering around a pasture, and that's the way I like it. And I love that. But sometimes I don't because I think many of us are conservative by nature and we just don't want things to change and so we stay in one place doing one thing and our life today exactly resembles what we were doing 30 years ago and what happens we've pulled it all up by the roots it's not working anymore it's not fruitful it isn't really happening But it's like, no, we're going to stay right here. There's that great little book called Who Moved My Cheese that's a parable about about some mice who lived in this maze, and they were eating this cheese until it was gone. And some of the mice decided to head out into the maze and find more cheese. But other mice just stayed where they were, and they're like, nope, this is where I found cheese before. This is where it's going to be again. A shepherd knows that that would be a sheep's tendency, They'd end up starving themselves. And so for the Pharisees, they were just like, we are not going to change. The Pharisees were the extreme conservatives of their day that said, we just need to preserve our present way of life. And if it isn't working now, tough. Because it used to work, and now it's going to work again. It's that mentality that says, I'm just locked into one way of doing things. And that was the Pharisees. The good shepherd, he goes, guys, if you're going to follow me, it means I'm going to move. And you're going to decide whether you're going to find your way to follow me. But if you stay here, my voice is going to become faint for you. I think one reason why sometimes as we get older... It seems like we can't hear God as much because maybe at some point we just decided to not move. We just decided this is what I do and I'm going to keep doing what I do, where I do it because it used to work and maybe someday it'll start working again. The shepherd knows that'll kill a sheep. The shepherd goes, if you hear my voice and you realize that I understand you, then you need to be willing to make an adjustment You need to be willing to be on the move, even though it's painful, and even though where he leads, sometimes you go through some really barren places and rocky places before you find another pasture, but you go, shepherd knows what he's doing. So I'm I'm ready to make moves. I'm ready to adjust. Jesus goes, that's what my sheep do. They follow me. And for a Pharisee, this would have felt like, 
Well, mine follow me. Really, where are you going? Nowhere, the same place we've been for 600 years. <laughs> That's not following. <laughs> that is, you've herded them up and now they're stuck. And so again, Jesus says, my sheep follow me. We're on the move. But then he says, my sheep hear my voice. I know them, they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life. In other words, I make them come more alive. I bring life to them. I have a life-giving effect on them. I feel, you know, they feel more alive when they're with me. See, if in those days you were following a Pharisee, that was such a dead religion. It was just going through the motions. The people who were just doing the right things and listening to the same stuff all over and over again. and everything. It was like, you know, the Stepford you know, group of people who, if you remember the movie, The Stepford Wives, I'm not recommending it, but <laughs> plenty of people I know, even without seeing the movie, have managed to imitate it really well. But just like, okay, I'm just going through my life, I'm just doing this, and, and never really go, wow, I'm alive. You know certain experiences that you've had. If you think back in your life, when did you feel most alive? Maybe it was when you jumped out of an airplane, hopefully with a parachute or you probably wouldn't be here. You know, maybe it was when you fell in love for the first time. Maybe it was when you discovered a talent that you had or it was winning some kind of championship. But throughout life, we have these experiences where it's like, whoa, I feel alive. I, um, when I used to fight, I would keep an ammonium capsule in my glove because sometimes you get hit so hard, you're like, I don't, I'm not, seriously, I'm like not sure where I am. What am I doing? And so I'd just break that little capsule, like smelling salts, and take a whiff of it. Whoo, I'm, al I'm back. <laughs> I'm totally awake. There are some things in life that do that for us. I Recently, when I went up to South Dakota for a few days and took my motorcycle up there, riding my motorcycle through the Black Hills and coming through and no helmet laws and and seeing, sorry if that stumbles you, you know, but seeing Mount Rushmore as, a, as you come around that bend and it's like, wow, and then these beautiful lakes and everything, it's like, I feel so alive right now. But Jesus says, I'm the kind of person who makes people have life. And not only that, it's eternal life, and they're never going to perish. They come alive when they meet me, and then they're going to be alive forever because of me. Compete with that. The Pharisees made people feel dead. They, in fact, they thought the best you could be is almost dead, because then you can't sin anymore. And that was their, their sort of mentality, they, Pharisees, were good at sucking the life out of people. And let's be honest. We all have people in our lives who are good at that. Where it's like, I felt alive until I talked to you for a few minutes. And then it's like, you know, everything's just being sucked out of me. Pharisees, life suckers. Jesus, a life giver. He said, I came that you would have life and that more abundantly, ridiculously, life. And he goes, so that's kind of what a shepherd does. That's what a shepherd is supposed to do. You get that? And then he says, I not only give them eternal life, they'll, you know, they're never going to perish and no one is able to pluck them out of my hand my father who gave them me is greater than all, and no one is able to pluck them out of my father's hand. Now, this was probably a shot at the Pharisees because what they were so upset about is that they thought he was stealing their people. Sometimes you hear churches say this, oh, they're sheep stealing. You know, they're taking people from our church. That's what they were accusing Jesus of. But he said, you know what? When they're in my hand, nobody can take them out. No one can pluck them. I'm not arguing. I'm not forcing anyone to stay. 
They're secure and safe, and they know that they are safe. They're not paranoid about wolves and things like that. Sheep don't even think like that. Shepherds think like that, and so therefore, they're looking out for me, but the sheep feel an overwhelming sense of security and safety because nobody can come and steal them. Nobody can come and yank them away from God. And so, you know, Jesus, again, it's another way in which what he does is superior. They're safe. The Pharisees were constantly paranoid about losing people. Jesus, not worried at all. He's like, there's the door, you can go. Remember when the rich young ruler came to Jesus and he said, okay, I want to follow you. Now, you'd think Jesus would have gone, cool, this guy could probably give a lot of money, he probably knows a lot, he could, you know, but instead, he said, well, go sell everything you have and give it to the poor and come and follow me, and you'll be fine. And the guy turned and walked away. Now, what would it have taken for Jesus at that point to stop him from walking away? He could have gone, wait, wait, let me explain something to you, and he could have laid it out for him. But it's not that Jesus didn't care because it says he looked at him and he loved him and he let him walk away because this is Jesus. You decide, do you wanna follow me? I'm not gonna force you, I'm not gonna make you. I love you, you're special to me, you're very valuable. But in the final analysis, when it comes down to it, if you want me, then I'm gonna protect you and you don't have to be worried. But I'm not paranoid about losing you. I know where you are. I know everything about you. I am with you everywhere you go, he would say. They're safe. And his sheep had a great sense of security, knowing that he has me. He's protecting me. He's going to cover me. And then finally, (laughs) the trump card that he plays the seventh thing, the the last thing that he says, match this. He says, oh, and by the way, I and my father are one. They were already confused when he's like, wait, is it your hand or is it the father's hand? And he goes, well, I and my father are one. Same thing. Besides the fact that this would blow their minds theologically, for him to claim to be God, they were infuriated And it said, and you know, you always dream of sharing with someone and having them go, wow, that's that's brilliant. You know, I had a counseling appointment this week on the phone and after I was finished, the the lady was going, you are a genius, that's so amazing. That's what you wanna hear. Just in case you wanna say something at the door, that works really well. (laughs) But you don't think about, I'm gonna give them my best stuff and they're gonna be looking for rocks. What are we going to throw? But that's, that's the reaction. Because as he finally made it clear who he was, they were, how do you compete with the guy being God? Saying that he's God, that radically affects everything that we do and everything that we believe. I and my father are one. So you can see why the Pharisees were threatened by this self-declared good shepherd. You can certainly see why They couldn't compete with him, and they were losing customers to him. Now, this presents a great lesson, and just looking through this thing, my sheep hear my voice, I understand them, and they follow me, I give them life, they will never perish, they're secure in my hand, and they're connected to God. Now, you look at that as an outline, and it's a pretty good outline of what leadership should be. And I consider this in thinking about, okay, who am I as a pastor and what am I supposed to do? How do people evaluate who they should follow when these people are, are leaders and who, who should lead? Now, you can use this to look at churches, but I would suggest to you too that for many of you, especially any of you who are husbands or fathers, that you're the pastor of your household. Now, some of you ladies are 
through, you know, a husband being gone or a husband just not being connected at all or whatever, you may be the head of your household, and that's fine too. This applies to you. If you're single, you still have a circle of influence that you are the uh, shepherd over. So here's a, a good little outline to consider. How are you doing? If you're a pastor, how are, how's your pastor doing? How are you doing as the leader of your household? And just go down the list. My sheep. Whose sheep are they? Whose kids are they? If you have children, whose kids are they? Are they yours and your reputation is at stake? Or do they belong to the good shepherd, to Jesus? Are they his? Do you treat them like they're his? In a church, it's so easy to treat the people like these are my people. I don't want anyone to take them. I totally understand that because you get attached to people and it does, it really hurts when people leave for whatever reason and yet you have to go, wait, these are God's people. So he may have a reason to be taking them somewhere else. Am I gonna be okay with that? As, as parents, is it, is it, do we understand these kids belong to him, we've dedicated them to him and we are to be committed as we are. So, and hear my voice. Are, they, are people listening to you and actually hearing God? Are you sharing with them what God says? Are you taking words of Jesus and translating them in a way that, that they get it? Or is it just you talking? Are you just going, if I'm gonna keep going and going and going and eventually they're gonna get it? The best way that you can lead others is to help them to hear his voice and to and for that to resonate, for them to go, wow, you know, when you say something, I can really tell that God's kind of behind it. And then I know them or I understand them. Do you even desire to really know what makes people tick that you're leading? Do you, do you listen to them enough? Do you pay attention to them? Do you give them the benefit of the doubt enough to connect with them in that way and especially to communicate to them God gets you. God understands you. You know, I, one of the things that hurts me the most is when I talk to people and they say, you know, I was thinking this and I was feeling like this. I was feeling resentful towards someone or I was thinking that I should do such and such a thing. And they go, and I know that's wrong. And I ask God for forgiveness. And I go, nothing that you feel is wrong. Nothing that you think is bad. It's just what you feel, what you think. And our, and our Father and our Lord Jesus just treasures each of those thoughts because he understands what's behind all of that. He doesn't freak out if you, he doesn't even freak out if you do something stupid, much less thinking something stupid. He understands that's who you are. So as leaders, do we connect in that way? Do we get behind the, the, what somebody's actually doing or saying and say, I totally understand that. I get that. And communicate, God understands you too. So you go, my sheep hear my voice. I know them. I understand them. And they follow me. Are we trying to drive people that we lead? Are we trying to force them to do the right things? Are we telling them do this, this, and this? Are we leading like Pharisees? Are we leading like a shepherd whose voice sounds out and who allows latitude and who gives certain freedoms under certain circumstances so that the people that we're leading can actually figure out who they are? Or are we just trying to make them just like us? Are we just going with our kids, because I love this sport, you're going to love it. I'm going to make you love it. It's a shepherd doesn't do that. Jesus doesn't do that to us, but he moves us. Do we inspire the people we lead to make moves, to actually make changes, to get out of their comfort zone and be stretched? Jesus does that. A good shepherd does that. They follow me. And then, do we make them feel more alive or do we make them feel more dead? I would hate it if if I thought people came to church and it's like, I felt pretty good when I came in this morning. 
But now, oh man, I just, I'm going to have to go home and watch Joel Osteen just so I can go to work Monday, you know. <laughs> or do we, do people go, I all of a sudden, not only do I get this, and I know you understand me and God understands me, but, ah, I'm ready to tackle another week because that was so life-giving. That was so inspiring. And the best life-giving thing is when people show you how to have life that lasts forever and shares with you the way that your life can belong to Jesus and that you can, you can live eternally. But eternity starts now. Are we leading in a way that is life-giving? And then, how about security? Do we make people feel like they're safe? Or are we constantly making them paranoid? Uh, I've mentioned before, you know, growing up as a kid in the, in the late 50s and early 60s with the Cold War and everything, I was scared to death of the communists. There were no communists around. I had a couple of teachers I was suspicious of but <laughs> in college. But we used to duck, they blew a horn and we ducked under our desk and covered our eyes because it was a nuclear drill. Like if we ever get nuked, a particle board desktop and our hands over our eyes, we'll be fine. We'll be trying to, as long as we get this down. But what does that do? It raised a generation of paranoid people. And unfortunately, I think that sometimes within the church, we can breed that kind of thing. We can take and we can make people feel like, oh, be careful. You know, Satan, he's going to steal your kids. Satan is going to ruin your life. You don't even know if you know him or not, because if you do that, sometimes, you know, you hear people go, there are sometimes people that dress a certain way that I just got to wonder if they really know God. Really? It's now about a dress code? That's Pharisees. That's not Jesus. Or, you know, I think that if pe how could somebody smoke or how could somebody drink and and still be a follower of Jesus and still be a Christian. And we want to legislate all this stuff instead of just going, you're safe, you're okay. Don't be paranoid, don't be afraid. God's gonna provide for you. He will take care of you. Don't be scared to death all the time. There are things to be afraid of, but then you take precautions against them so that a sheep will go, yeah, there's wolves out here, I've heard. But I got a shepherd, like David was, who would kill a lion or a bear in order to protect his sheep, who if I get too far off the path, he leaves the 99 and goes after the one. I think if we're leading the way God wants us to, the people who we influence, whether it's our family, our church, our Sunday school class, or the people we work with, I think we will make them feel more relaxed and more safe, knowing that God's hand is wrapped around us. And then ultimately, the ultimate leadership is to introduce people to God himself and to realize, as Jesus said, I and my Father are one. See me, you see the Father. I don't completely understand that, but all I know is I have come into a relationship with the God who made me because I listened to what he had to say. And so, this becomes a really effective template, I think, for leadership and one that we could, we could learn a lot about. And I, and I would say in general, if you are in a leadership position, if you're a dad or you're a, a mom who's the head of a household, if you're a single people who, if you're a single person who has a circle of friends that you influence, if you're a, an employer with people that you employ, if you, whatever your position is, or if you're a pastor or a leader or a Bible study leader or a director, you know, a, a host of a home fellowship or whatever, you can just ask yourself, given these verses, my sheep hear my voice, I know them, they follow me, I give to them eternal life, they'll never perish, nobody's able to snatch them out of my hand, my father who gave them me is greater than all and nobody can snatch them out of his hand, I and my father are one. Look at that. And you will find out, am I more of a Pharisee in my leadership style or am I more like Jesus? It really becomes clear when you break it down that way. Now, there may be some of you here today who never actually have totally got what it's about. 
I mean, and you've had good feelings about Jesus at different times and you admire Christians. Maybe you've even gone to church for a long, long time, but you have to go, you know, the truth is, when I hear what he says, I don't get it. It really isn't making a lot of sense. I haven't noticed him saying, you're mine. I don't know what that security feels like. Today would be the perfect day to decide to respond to his voice if you hear it. Now, if everything that I'm saying, it makes no sense to you at all, and you're like, I don't get this, then that's okay. I mean, we love you. You're welcomed here. You, if you live another week, you'll have another shot at it next week. It's, it's, I, don't, I don't have any inside information that the end is going to world, that the world is going to end this week. Unless we go bomb Syria and Syria's, to, you know, who knows? <laughs> Crazy stuff out there. But if you are here and there's something deep inside of you that's just going, oh shoot, I think this is starting to make sense. Then hear his voice. He's speaking to you. And decide to follow him. Decide to respond to his voice. There'll be people up here in the front who would just love to pray with you and introduce you to life with Jesus Christ. You can start your life over today. And that would be an amazing thing that you could do for yourself because you're going to find life like you've never known it before. So if you haven't accepted Jesus Christ, but you're hearing his voice right now, then follow him. Respond to him. Come on down and get right with him. And then your spiritual birthday can be my anniversary, and you'll always remember it and <laughs> get us a present next year. No, just kidding. <laughs> Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. When we think about it, we realize how we take for granted your incredible leadership as our shepherd. But frankly, we don't always consider what a blessing we have to be under shepherds over your sheep. Deliver us from pharisaical thinking. Help us to lead others the way you lead us, to learn from your example. And Lord, if there are people here who don't know you, but this is the day that you're drawing them to yourself, I pray that right now you would make your voice very clear to them and that they will have the courage to respond by coming up and getting right with you, following you. Draw people to yourself. Give them life. Make them your sheep. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. It's all stand.